Hello and welcome to the Synergia People Podcast 2023. I'm Deborah Parrish Snyder. I am a farmer publisher, campaigner for planetary stewardship, and I've been engaged in different ecological projects since 1984. How did you join this group here at Synergia? You weren't here from the beginnings, right? No, I was found this particular troupe in this line of work with Ecotechnics back in 1981. I first stumbled when I was uh, just graduated from college into the Les Marronniers Conference Center near Aix-en-Provence in southern France, and uh, they needed somebody to run the farm there. So I was looking for something to do. So I sat, I raised my hand and I began the, a lifetime of adventures. The people running the farm in France were the people who are here at Synergia. At the time, there were, it was Molly Augustine and Greg Dugan. Greg Dugan is a neighbor uh, and was a captain of the Heraclitus for a few years before he moved to southern France to run the conference center. So I came in when they were doing a theater performance, actually. I came to Aix-en-Provence, and somebody told me that there were these Americans doing organic agriculture up north of Aix. So I found them, and he said, oh, well, we're very busy right now doing a theater performance tonight. Would you like to come? I said, of course. So I made my way to my first performance <laughs> of by the Theater of All Possibilities, and it was a production of Les Bonnes by Jean Genet. And I was hooked with this. I said, I'd never seen anything like it before in my life. It was a brilliant production. And the next day I came out for tea and I said, well, what else, what else are you guys doing here? <laughs> and then you joined the farm in France. He said, would I like to come and run the farm? And I said, oh, sure. I just took a three-month organic stretch. I don't have a lot of experience. My family are farmers from Illinois. What yeah. brought you then back to the U.S. when you love France, when you speak fluently French. A decade of adventures around the planet with the theater of all possibilities and uh, a year living in the Australian outback. I also started a publishing company called Synergetic Press, which I run today still. And uh, that was in 1984 uh, in London. So it wasn't until the middle of, until after we'd started the Biosphere 2 project, which started in 1984, that I came back to spend more time in the States. I was uh, alternating half a year in London. I was running the publishing company and uh, going back and forth. I was part of the startup team at Biosphere 2. The Institute brought the intellectual capital to the project, put together the the, the company and the business ventures and the financing in order to have mm. the conference to get the intellectual cadre of scientists and engineers mm. involved. So for the first two years, we held conferences and uh, bought the property and started the got the it was the Motorola Conference Center, I believe, that we bought. And there was this open land where that eventually became the building site of Biosphere Two. But after the first couple of years, then there was enough going on that I could see that basing myself in the States at Biosphere 2 Project and running the publishing department was the thing to do. So I, about 1986, uh, moved my base back to the United States. When you have to describe what hooked you up with these people with the project? The incredible sense of freedom, the ability to do, uh, the, the ability to imagine uh, or to formulate your dreams and uh, find a way to actually materialize those dreams through um, support from uh, your colleagues. Find, you know, having, having a base of operation was also important. The economics of uh, the synergias, as they're called, were uh, fascinating to me. I majored in economics and I was in this left wing economics department at University of Massachusetts. So I got Sheila Robotham at a very young age. And so I had a little bit of a background of social justice, kind of the ideas of, you know, owning the means of production, owning land, the importance of owning land and, uh, you know, the economics of that. Uh, but, you know, more of a blend of, of these things. And I could see that the synergias were, uh, had, had this very, very strong economic sustain, you know, model, a new kind of model of community and it, like an extent and not outside breaking out of the nuclear family, but into, it was early intentional communities. I was, you know, they'd already done a lot of work for 10 years working out some of the rough patches. Uh, about how do you develop a uh, different uh, communities around the planet that are studying, interested in studying the biosphere. 
those big ideas and the strong economic base and the incredible sense of freedom. What kind of dreams came true here? It's a very significant question because obviously I wouldn't be continuing to do all this if I wasn't actually um, enjoying uh, the results of, of, of 40 years of effort. I hope so, yes. Yeah. So um, the, the Synergetic Press for me has been uh, uh, the realization of a dream where it is right now. I mean, we are looking for uh, the kind of uh, uh, infusion at this point that to really solidify our position as an independent, uh, very unique publishing company, a voice for social justice and the, the marginalized voices that don't get heard so much in the fields of, of, of medicine, psychedelic medicine, uh, uh, social justice, uh, ethnobotany, the, uh, uh, the rights of nature, the planet, you know, the, uh, the Anthropocene, bringing awareness to people that, you know, your average trade publisher is not going to go out of his way looking for a book on the Anthropocene. You know, those are significant concepts that we feel need to be invested in and communicated. So now we have a team of people. It's not just me anymore. So I would say that I have realized a dream through the help and support of some of the colleagues that have joined me and the incredible contact with uh, elders and the wisdom that they possess and the, the books of knowledge that they have brought to us. And that they, mm -hmm. it's, it's very rewarding to see something where you had to, we had to create the market with these books. There was no demand. Since you weren't here from the beginning, but you've been here now long enough, like four decades. <laughs> What is the beginning? The beginning is in the end and the end is in the right. beginning. It's so always my something. My <laughs> question goes in the direction. What it's, I mean, it's really quite a diverse group of people. What has hold them together? Where see? there is a common interest, you see a manifestation, like the work that's going on in the orchard and the agroecology complex. There's a, 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 a group of individuals that are aligning and emerging around that. Some people are old timers, some are new timers. Uh, and in other cases, it, there's individuality. I mean, the whole idea is basically, you know, how to become a better human being. And, you know, if you have any kind of spiritual pursuits whatsoever yeah. in one's life, besides just learning how to grow carrots, some people work better on the individual kind of level. So I would say that there's a lot, there's a number of individuals that circulate through these different projects, which in wonderful, bring wonderful things. And it really takes a village in, in this true sense. And then there, there's a, the, there are the core teams that really align with the idea or the task, let's say, and, and where there is no task, then you have no alignment and there is no glue. What for you in a personal way are the biggest learning, the biggest takeaway you have from this time? Uh, well, the people that I'd met in my life and um, had uh, the good fortune to work with that have influenced me the most, um, besides John, my partner, uh, love of my life and uh, incredible teacher, you know, one of the most practical people on the planet. And he's been able to communicate ways of being and constructive, you know, uh, approaches to, uh, to working on tasks and projects that are, you know, not based on profit maximization, but profit, you know, just make it just sustainability. So he was a major influence on me and, uh, still is, uh, as I, you know, work to harvest the legacy and, uh, uh, what is, 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 is experiencement is what he calls it, where you have the experience, but you're also having an experiment so um, one can look at their life as an experiencement if you yeah. are pushing and looking into challenges and learning. In my case, I knew I wanted to travel. I knew, I mean, for instance, I was a very little girl, you know, I was, and so I was looking for any kind of driving, air, flying airplanes, any kind of, you know, air, you know, train conductors. That was, yeah. you know, I had, and then I, you know, found this, uh, this crew that had a, a boss, 16 seater, 12 gear electronic shift Mercedes Cetra bus with a kitchen in the back and a bunk for the drivers 
And guess who signed up to be the driver of that bus? You. Yes. So for a few years, I was a driver and the stage manager for the Theater of All Possibilities. And I traveled around Europe. I went yeah. to places. I went to, you know, Poggenford. I went to Poland. I went to, we went to places I never, ever thought I would have gone to all in this bus. And I was driving, you know, yeah. I mean, and it was just awesome. So those were wonderful. And I learned, and I learned that the planet, first of all, it's necessary to travel because you get outside of your own culture. You Absolutely. grow so much. You know this very well you know, you're a master of this. And that's the key to evolution. That's the key to planetary culture. The idea that we live in an ethnosphere, that we have a sphere of cultures around the planet. Now we have the technosphere. We now can see that where our technosphere is, which is basically, you know, uh, uh, running the planet to a large degree, that in the world market. But how can humanity start to live in uh, support of our biosphere yeah. rather than allowing this plundering and pillaging of yeah. the natural resources that yeah. we have here that are uh, tipping the balance. The other place I learned so much from was living in uh, for over 30 years, uh, six to eight months, uh, six to eight weeks a year, I would go to the outback in Australia. And I worked on from a, an internship with the Institute about Savannah system management. By 2010, I became the chairman of the uh, company that was the holding company of this 5,000 acre pastoral regeneration station yeah. in Northwest Kimberley in this incredible town, which was, you know, a huge amount of Aboriginal culture. Seeing that go through 30 years of just that shift up there in the middle of the, from a place of just ringers and huge cattle industry, you know, taking over the entire area. And then you have all the Aboriginals that have been put into communities. And then you have this incredible uh, health crisis and uh, economic crisis within the Aboriginal culture community that took was still, we were, we actually went there because there was, and got some of the places, because we had history of working with the civil rights in the States, they had an Aboriginal uprising thing going on at Fitzroy Crossing. Yeah. And so actually one of the first properties that was got purchased was Quamden Downs, which was a million acre station right next in the heart of the Aboriginal mm -hmm. land. It's important to find common ground and theater sometimes is a great way too, you know, I mean, Absolutely. so, and then that was also just, you know, looking at ecological, early ecological approaches to how you can, you know, have run a cattle station out in the middle of the outback. So the seed station, the past the month, the 5,000 acre one was like the postage stamp size station that I landed on. And that really, I, I walk with the, the land of, of Birdwood Downs inside of me every step. Mm -hmm. every day yeah. very very powerful land it's the savannah where humanity was supposed to have stepped out come out of right so it's yeah. there's a lot of um deep vibrations there's dream time so we but it was living uh, it was basically the sense of life so i was a suburban kid and i was out there with king browns living out there on veranda living you know there was no it, doors walls yeah. wind, windows screened verandas you know that was it and I was in the outback and uh, nobody told me anything, but I got to drive a 4280 dual tread tractor. I used to ran the disc plow. I got up to the bulldozer. I baled hay. I baled thousands of bales of hay. I mowed paddocks. I pulled out wattle trees. I chopped out wattle every day for uh, the time I would be there for an hour. We'd go out with our ads That's and we would chop you. out the wattles. And so that made me very, very strong, very confident about you know, being able to be out, like live, be outdoors. And so it's like, and, can, that, and that you can make it. Yeah. And it's That's... really important to have a contact with our wilderness selves. So for me having that, and I, we let it go a couple of years ago, we had to let it go. And I still cry because I love that land. Where do you see the future of all of this? Well, there's a, there is a definitely a trans, an age d difference from 30, I would say 35 in our directors, on our board of directors, 35 to uh, 80. And, you know, that's a relatively small board, like 12 members. So, you know, we have representatives of, and we're bringing in some more younger ones. There was a period of time when there weren't a lot of young people coming around seeking anything, looking for anything. I would say it was about five years ago that suddenly the floodgates started to come out again. Well, of course, COVID shut down a lot. We couldn't have the volunteers come through. So yeah. we were just starting to have them again. They were just starting to come. You know, but we want manage. you know, we're looking for managerial types. And, and they're showing up now. You put out a call for, you know, then we, and we also had to prepare ourselves. There was a, you know, there was like things go in cycles, there's ebbs and flows, um, you know, resources are not always available. We, so, you know, as we 
have the capacity to expand and, and open up these other things. Often people driven, uh, these capacities are opened up because of the, the, the people that have the will, uh, the idea and can get other people convinced that it's a good idea to join in with them. Having, being able to hold the space, these spaces that we hold is the key. Who can predict exactly what the future will bring? No one but can. you can only leave the opportunities there available. And so, you know, uh, our Institute of Ecotechnics, we are building right now uh, a team of people that are really engaged in the mission, want to ha- get more involved, uh, finances being the limiting factor of really what we can do in terms of accomplishing our dreams. Um, so they are signing up and helping to actually generate the resources so that they can actually come on board and be able to do and engage in some of these and, and help make these projects go forward. Like the Heraclitus, you know, there's a renaissance of, uh, of both necessity for an ocean going vessel and, uh, a desperate, uh, need these, these people, it was the number one, when we have that ship in the water it's the number one magnet where all the young kids go without fail. I can imagine, people will yeah. come through here and then it's like, so education, research, eyes on the ocean, uh, climate emergency, that's all hands on deck. And that ship is going back in the water as a project. We've been missing the ocean biome project. So we have been, uh, uh, our capacity has been limited for being a planetary organization and that, you know, being mostly an ocean. Really, it, 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 it is kind of like the flagship project in, 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 an accurate sense. Yeah, this is how um, I understood it. Yeah. You know, uh, so that beautiful new hall that we have, the beautiful, uh, strong uh, crew and uh, people that have dedicated their, you know, the last 20 to 30 years of their lives to, you know, keeping that ocean going pro- vessel as a vessel. It's a, it's a, it's a space, it's a place where, where uh, manifest manifestations can take place. And, um, you know, uh, and that's just so hard to find anywhere. So that's mm. why you have to hold these spaces where, you know, right. um, freedom and yeah. uh, expression and the new can be uh, created. Last thing, Tango, if you would need to summarize what is going on here in five words, what would these five words be? Center for Innovation and Action. That's it. Five words exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening and please stay tuned for the next episode of the Synergia People Podcast 2023.